So welcome to Office Hours. This training is being recorded. There we go. So some housekeeping. If you shared a registration link with somebody else, then just make sure that your name is on your little uh, Brady Bunch box, if you would. Um, we do like to know who's here. And sometimes it's a little bit weird to look at the participants and there's like eight people with the same name. Um, and then, you know, we'd love to have you let other participants and us know who's here uh, just by dropping your name, position, and district in the chat. That way, you know, we all know um, who's attending. So today for office hours, we're going to talk about section six, seven, and eight of the IEP. So we are the IDEA support team. Um, we are part of the Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education for the Maine Department of Education. So this is the team, um, and I think everybody's here today. Colette, do you want to come on and say hello? I can do that. Hi, everyone. I'm Colette Sullivan. I'm the Federal Programs Coordinator. Um, before I joined the department, I worked as a special ed teacher for 30 years. Nice Thank to see you. you all. Thank you for joining us. Jennifer, you want to come on? Hi, I am Jennifer Gleason, and I have been with the department about a year and a half. And before that, I too was a special ed teacher. Thank you. Carly? Hi, I'm Carly Thibodeau. Um, I joined the department in July, and I was a teacher before that for 21 years. Awesome. Julie? I've been with the department for about six and a half years now. Prior to that, I was um, admin support at a K-5 elementary school for 16 years. Thank you. And I'm Leora Byers. I'm a former special education teacher in an SPPS, and I joined the department four years ago. So here is our contact information. We'd love to get emails with questions, looking for guidance. Um, we'd much rather have you reach out and be able to, you know, give you some feedback um, about something uh, rather than have you do something in a non-compliant way. And, you know, so please feel free to reach out to us. We're all pretty good about getting back to people um, and we love to have people reach out. So today um, we did introductions. We're going to go through just a couple of sides of some links. Those of you who are with us for PD often, you will likely recognize these and already have them. Um, then we're going to go through section six of the IEP, Supplementary Aid Services, Modifications and Supports. We're going to go through section seven, which is special education and related services. And then we're going to finish things up with section eight, least restrictive environment. So um, after we are done today, you will um, so at the very end of today, there's a QR code. Carly will come on and tell you all about it. But if you if you click on that and give us feedback and you put in your email address correctly, um, then you will get the procedural manual along with um, our IEP quick reference and a contact hour and user and all sorts of wonderful prizes will show up in your um, in your email box. So when you do that later on, again, Carly will tell you all about it. Make sure to put in your email correctly. Leora, can I interrupt real quick? Of course. We received a lot of feedback too. We really, you know, we, we take your feedback and really try to put it into place. And one of the bits of feedback we've gotten quite consistently is that people really want to have access to the PowerPoint prior to the, um, you know, to have it available as they're going through this training. So this PowerPoint has been linked to the PD calendar. So if you have not already grabbed it, you can go back there and grab it. Is it the, the new one, Julie, or was, was it the bare bones one? Okay. A couple days ago, the one that you, um, the draft, um, okay. because we had some changes at the last minute and- yep. Perfect. So the if you go back to that calendar, you, you're gonna get like a bare bones draft of today, which has the information, but it's not as pretty and there's not as much detail. Um, if you um, just wait for this attachment, you will get it in all its glory in the, in the final stage that it is in right now. I know that you guys have seen this, those of you who are with us a lot, um, but you know how much we love alignment. 
um, on this team and how much we love a visual. And everything really goes back to alignment to, um, to the IEP, to the child's um, disability category, to the evaluation. So we really start with that information and we build from there. Um, and just making sure that we're keeping in mind least restrictive environment um, as we go through. So we're going to start out with Section 6, Supplementary Aid Services, Modifications, and or Supports. Um, when you're filling out Section 6, it's important that as an IEP team, you're really talking about all of these fields. You know, what kind of um, service, uh, supplementary aids, accommodations, et cetera, does that child need in order to access state? What environment are they going to be um, using these accommodations in? Not forgetting that some accommod accommodations or modifications aren't allowed on certain assessments. Um, generally speaking, the location would be special education, general education. Um, you know, it could be a combination of, of both. Frequency could be as needed for our um, monitoring purposes. Your IEP team might want you to be more detailed in the frequency column, and that is perfectly fine too. And, oh, awesome, our interpreter's here, great. Um, and the duration, unless there's an amendment, which we know happens, um, the duration would coincide with the, um, the duration of the IEP. So if you have ed techs or adult support, BHP, BHP support, um, related service assistants that are working with your students, um, our guidance is to put that information in section six. This is just one compliant example of how to do that. There's probably a thousand others that you guys are using in the field and that's wonderful. Um, the reason for this A is to document the amount of support that the student needs in order to access state, um, but also so that the parents know who's working with their child. Uh, we know that the related service assistants would not be on the service grid, but you certainly would want, you know, the family to know that, you know, while those services are being supervised by the related service provider, it's the assistant who's giving those services supporting the child. Um, so you can see that this particular child is getting this, the, the BHP support in core content through all of classroom instruction and the various assessments they participate in, in both the general and special education setting as needed. And again, for our purposes, as needed is just fine. Um, but if your IEP team or your director would like you to be more detailed, then please Please do what they would like you to do. Um, so if we're talking about an accommodation, for example, an accommodate, accommodation means that you're changing the manner in which the instruction and assessment is delivered, but it doesn't alter the curriculum level expectation being measured or taught. So the most common example that I could think of is a book. You know, you have your print version, and then you have a child who might have comprehension or you know, visual tracking issues, um, and they get the audio version of the book. As long as it's the same book, then it's the same material, so it doesn't alter anything that's happening because it's the same material just in a different way. So here are just some other examples. So um, there's this OSEP Ideas That Work website, and this is a PDF with a lot of information about um, both accommodations and modifications. And again, you guys are all special educators. I am sure that you could think of a million more accommodations, um, but these are just some examples. So um, allowing your student to take a test or do their work orally instead of um, you know, write, written um, additional time. Uh, peer support for note-taking is another one. Um, giving graph paper to, you know, for the child to be able to line up their math problems. Um, record lectures, use a computer or a keyboard for writing. Those are just some examples of accommodations. So those would not change the material that the child is accessing. And then you get into modifications and modifications change what student is expected to learn. 
So the changes are made to provide the student with opportunities to participate meaningful and productively with the other students in a classroom and their school learning experiences. And some examples could be um, changing the instructional level, changing the content or curriculum that the child is working on or the student is working on, um, looking at the performance criteria and adjusting that for specific students. Um, or how the assignment is structured. So those are just some ideas. And, and just remember that the modification is actually changing what the student is expected to learn. So that would um, affect, you know, the content of assessments, for instance, they might not have the, you know, the base information that they would need. Um, so just something to, to think about. And this came from shaker.org, which I had not heard about, but it's a, it's a nice PDF that really details um, accommodations and uh, modification. And here are some examples of modifications. Again, this is from the OSEP um, PDF. So um, uh, alternative books or materials that are on the same theme or topic, but maybe they're a little bit lower in their comprehension level. Um, using a uh, spell check, having a word bank, for um, answers to test questions, using a calculator on a math test, um, having film or video supplements instead of a, a textbook, um, or you know, differentiating how the child is showing you what they're learning, how do they show you, um, you know, comprehension. So allowing them to do project-based learning instead of a written report, for example, or you know. Um, you know, going through the text and highlighting the um, the keywords and phrases so that they get those context clues like immediately when they're looking at them. Um, again, 100% confident that you guys are using a million other modifications. This is just an example. So when we're talking about other in section six, this is where you could put the C word collaboration, but not use the word consultation. This is where, you know, when we talk about consultation as a service, so if it's not related to a goal, you can put it in section six. This is directly from the procedural manual. So it's talking about how the other could include collaboration, recommendations from related service providers. Um, so, you know, the OT could come in and show you how to set up a student's space. So that would be that collaboration piece, not directly aligned to a goal. So that's why we would put that collaboration, not the other C word, in section six as a supplementary service for that child, because it's just the adult interacting with the adult on behalf of the child. So, um, if you have supports that you're teaching the student, whether it's a self-regulation toolkit or just use different um, manipulatives to help them attend to their classes, please make sure that they're in section six of the IEP so that if that child goes to other classrooms, if they're not in a self-contained area, or even if they are in self-contained and you're out sick one day, that you know, other folks have a very clear idea by looking at this document what that child needs in order to be successful. So we put this one like a sensory toolkit, a help card, a break card, a squishy, visual aids, check-ins, uh, reduce the number of problems to demonstrate proficiency. Again, just some examples, not an exhaustive list. If you are someone who works with multilingual learners um, and you have a student who has an individual language acquisition plan, also called an ILAP. This is our guidance about how you would document that in the IEP document itself. So this is for those students who are both identified with special education needs and with multilingual learner needs. Um, our guidance would be just to put the ILAP in section six, the individual language acquisition plan, the child would have um, access to that plan through all of the domains, assessments and instruction in both special ed and general education as needed. And that would coincide with the, um, the duration of the IEP as well. 
So we're going to go down to 6B of the IEP where we document what assessments the child is going to be taking. Are they taking the alternate or are they going to be taking the regular district assessment? So we started monitoring this section last year um, and we just monitored for whether or not 6B was blank. Um, because it can't be blank. This is a this is a, a big one, okay? So if you check yes, then you're saying that the child qualifies. So you're saying that the IEP team went through the participation decision flowchart and decided that the alternate assessment, the, the multi-state alternate assessment, is appropriate for that child to take. And that's great. That's awesome. So just put a little explanation, just of a couple of sentences about how the team came to that, um, to that um, decision. And then that child's academic goals require objectives. So for compliance purposes, we would flip back to 5A of the IEP and just make sure that those academic goals have objectives. So if the team determines that the child is gonna take the alternate, then you know having that um, explanation in in 6B about how the team used that participation decision flowchart and why the and why that's the appropriate assessment for the child is required um, in that section of the IEP. There is the Muser citation if you would like to look it up. So then. You know, we've talked about citations before, you know, when we talk about section five of the IEP, when we're looking at goals, if the child takes the alternate assessment, there are alternate academic achievement standards that would uh, be aligned to the child's academic goals. So you wouldn't align them just to the main learning results. You would follow this link right here and go to the alternate academic achievement standards. So these standards, are aligned to the state academic content standards at grade level, but they're broken down into much smaller chunks. Um, they provide access points to the general curriculum. We would really, we really encourage you to assume competence. Start with the highest possible standard that you think that child could um, accomplish and then work your way down to, to where you think that the to where the goal is for the child for the next year. Um, this, you know, the, the alternate ach academic achievement standards uh, facilitate inclusion in the IEP and they ensure that students are on track for post-secondary education or competitive workforce opportunities. So these are derived from those state grade levels. So these are derived from the main learning results. They're just in the breadth and complexity. They're not a replacement of grade level standards. They're just smaller accessible steps to support the students who take the alternate assessment, the students who have the most significant cognitive disability, 1% population. So here is an example of what it could look like. So we have a goal about Lily. She participates in conversations um, including but not limited to eye contact with the speaker, using text-to-speech device to express her own thoughts in five out of 10 opportunities per week, per week right now. The goal is that within a year, we want her to get to eight out of 10 opportunities. She can do that. So the objectives are just smaller chunks. So you can see that this IEP goes to November, so it started in November. So by February, so that's like what a three month chunk, we're gonna get her from five out, out of 10 opportunities to six out of 10 opportunities. And then we've got another chunk by May, we're gonna get her to seven out of 10 opportunities. And you can have more than two objectives. I just gave two um, just for uh, example purposes. All right, you know how we love participation. So we'd like you to take just a minute and look at this section six and, and, and just put in the chat box what's wrong. What's wrong in this section six? There are, there are three big ones. There might be more that I actually did unintentionally too. 
Oh, Renee, perfect. Not all areas are filled out. We can't have blank boxes. If there's something in the left column, it has to go all the way over to the right. Perfect. Anything else that people see? Okay, I guess you guys are not feeling it today. Oh, thank you. Perfect. The first set of accommodations are not assessment related. That's awesome. They're not because we know that, you know, especially on district wide assessments or state assessments, extended time, you know, frequent check ins and outline prior to introducing the material that's not going to work on those assessments. So thank you very much. Um, the other one. I fancied it up by circling it, circling everything. Um, the other one is that I really feel like if you're going to have a self-regulation toolbox, that there should be some details here about what is actually in that toolbox so that everyone's on the same page. Um, yeah, and then the projects not being allowed on the assessments and outlines not, you know, being allowed on assessments in those blank boxes. All right, thank you guys. So, any questions in the chat box before we go on to section seven? I don't see anything, but I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. I don't see anything either, Leora. All right, we're going to move on then to section seven. Okay, so again, if you've been in our IEP trainings, this is a slide that you're familiar with. Um, that, and we want to keep in mind as we do section seven that the child's needs drive their services and their frequencies, not the school or program schedule. And of course, the caveat is that we know that that is extremely difficult, especially when we talk about block schedules in high school and middle school. But it's really something that we should keep in mind um, as we, um, you know, go through when we talk about least restrictive environment as well, for example. So there's some guidance on uh, main care reimbursable services. So we have links to these training resources and to the recording. Um, if you need a, a fresh up of, um, of the KEPRO and how that main care reimbursable services stuff works, this is a great place to, to find that information. And we also had guidance come back, uh, come out way back, gosh, this is three years ago now, that seemed to go by awfully fast, um, that BCBA services would be documented under other on the service grid, which totally makes sense if you think about it, because remember, we always talk about the service could be related to the goal, and BCBA folks are going to have a goal, right? They're, they're working on specific skills with your students, so it makes sense that they would be under other, and then that service would be So speech and language services are direct, meaning they're at the top of that um, section seven. If the child has a speech or language impairment, either by itself or as part of a multiple disability, or if the child is identified with autism and the speech language services are their only service on their IEP, in any other situation, um, speech language would be a related service. So when we're in section seven, we look for alignment. We look for the service to be in a goal and we look for um, it to be on the service grid. So we flip back and forth and make sure that there's alignment back and forth. So, um, and that's pretty much any time, this is directly from the procedural manual. So unless the child is in a self-contained program, you would definitely wanna have all their services listed. So I just gave some examples about how those given statements might look in, um, in section five of the IEP in a goal. So given SDI and ELA slash behavior support or given SDI and ELA slash uh, or and OT consultation. Um, and that's because we get a lot of questions about how to document SDI in behavior support or executive functioning. And this is one way to do it, you know, because we understand that that behavior support or that executive functioning work is happening through all of the other SDIs. They're happening through all the other classes. So this is one way to be able to do that without having that behavior support at, at have its own line. 
So this is what it looks like on the service grid itself. So you can see that we have ELA slash behavior support by the special education teacher. Because remember, it's the folks with certifications that can be the person responsible. So the um, special education teacher, the occupational therapist, the physical therapist, the speech and language pathologist, the location could be special education, general education, or both. Frequency, minutes, hours, weekly, daily, monthly, however you want to do that, just try and make sure that a parent's going to understand the services that the child has. And unless there's been an amendment, duration would coincide with the duration of the IEP, except with extended school year. If you have the duration for extended school year be the same as the IEP, then you are saying that you are offering extended school year services through the entire year. So vacations, et cetera, my guess is you don't want to do that. So if you don't know if this annual is in September and you're not sure what the dates are going to be, um, I just picked 7 1 to 8 20 because that's a window when ESY services happen. Um, so there's, there's some guidance. Um, and you can see that the consult, the OT consult is here as well. And he and the child is getting that 30 minutes monthly. So that alignment piece, every service needs a goal and every so and every goal needs a service. So I just talked about that. We don't want to um, identify the person responsible by name. It's their position, that certified or licensed position that's responsible on the service grid. So don't put names. Um, location, again, would be special education, general education, or both. So um, I talked about this piece. So this takes, so the regardless of the educational setting, direct and related services should not exceed the regular school day or week. Um, if you're, this comes into play most often with a self-contained room or with an out-of-district placement. Um, that's where I worked when I was a teacher. So my baseline for SDI on my IEPs was six, uh, five days a week, six hours a day for 30 hours a week. All of my kids got lots of related services. So if they had an hour of PT, an hour of OT, two hours of speech and language, then that reduces the SDI down to 26 hours because those other related services are going to take up that other time on the service grid. So it's all going to add up to that three hours. Um, the one slide that I just realized that I did not keep in here today is that when you're doing the service grid, you're writing the goals um, and the services based on the skill deficit. So we would not want to see goals in health or goals in social studies or goals in science. It could definitely be that the child is getting um, SDI in those classes, but it's about the reading proficiency, for example. So if we look in this in section five of the IEP, it's likely that we would see reading comprehension goals. Um, just for an example, so the goals and the services should be aligned to the skill deficits, not the class that the child is taking. Hopefully that makes sense. I wish I had left that slide in. Okay. So this is what we're talking about, about the, um, the child's needs drive the services, not the school or program schedule. Um, this was a kid who has some executive functioning issues, specifically time management. This particular district has a guided study hall, an SDI guided study hall. So when looking at this information, we can see that the child is getting executive functioning, um, SDI and executive functioning by the special education teacher in the special education setting for 120 minutes a week. Um, if you go lower than that, that's an issue because you need to make sure you're providing what the service grid says. If you consistently go higher than 120 minutes, if the need is greater than that, then you might want to consider amending the IEP so it reflects the child's current needs. Um, but just keep in mind that the time that the child has for SDI is the time that they are working with the person responsible on the goal. So if they're just sitting in an SDI, you know, 
doing whatever, you know, playing a game on their phone or whatever, that doesn't count as SDI time because they're not working on their goals. So we just want to keep that in mind because we don't want to over restrict our special education kids. So here's a couple of examples and either one of these is compliant. So the first example is that the child gets reading in the special education setting for 30 minutes a week. But they also get reading as a push-in service. So this child is getting both pull-out and push-in services for a total of 50 minutes a week. You are absolutely compliant if you, or if the IEP team, or if you would like to do the upper example where it's a little bit more detailed, that's perfectly fine. For our purposes, you are absolutely welcome to put them um, below together in just one line. But again, talk to your IEP team about what they would prefer to see. Okay, transportation. Transportation is a related service. So if the IEP team determines that the transportation service has an instructional component, like learning how to ride the bus without punching somebody or something like that, then there should be an annual goal in the IEP that's corresponding to that. And if you think about it, if you have a child who has significant behavior issues and is no longer able to ride the, the general education bus and is now riding a special education bus, it is very likely that that child has a goal already on their IEP or um, you know, maybe self-regulation, for example. So in that case, you could just amend the IEP and add you know, during transportation or um, you know, that type of a thing to the goal and then put it on the service grid so that you have alignment again between that goal for those teaching those um, behaviors about how to be safe on the bus in the service. All right. Get ready because I got another quiz for you, but this is the last one for today. We're going to, I'm going to let, we're going to go through LRE without a quiz. So can you please just, there's three that I know of on here. <laughs> Maybe there's more. Um, just put in the chat box, what are some errors that you see on this um, section seven? Ian Sutherland, you're absolutely correct. The boxes are not all filled in. ELA and behavior together is perfectly fine. If the child has SDI and ELA and has a goal in behavior or, you know, for functional stuff, then putting those services um, together is, is perfectly fine. Ah, the specific name. Very good. Sally Smith, we want um, the special education teacher there. And ESY is the total duration. Very good. And I think Yep, so the person responsible is the specific name, the ESY dates are the duration of the IEP, and the frequency for the OT consult. Awesome. All right. Anyone have any questions or want to jump in quick before we go on to LRE? I don't see anything in the chat box. So I'm going to move on, but you guys know if you put it in the chat box, we'll make sure that we answer it. All right, so nature and severity of the disability. So I bet Jennifer is cringing right now as I start talking about this. Um, you'll On the actual prompt on the IEP, it does not match what we're looking for. What we're looking for is a statement of the nature and severity of the disability. Jennifer is on the IEP committee. You may have heard this before. She is working to get that prompt changed the next time the IEP is updated. Um, but that's what we're looking for. And I do have an example, but I found this really interesting visual. And I like it because it's kind of upside down to what we normally see for visuals with LRE. And it kind of made, it made my brain hurt a little bit, but in a good way, because it's all interesting to start thinking about things in different ways, right? So that's why I included this specific one. I promise you it was not to confuse you. Um, so this particular example has the least restrictive environment at the top. That's the regular education classroom. So that's where you're going. That's where we want all of our kids to be, is at the top of their pyramid. Um, and you know, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy and all that, like we always want to be at the top and help our kids get there so they're living their best lives, right? 
So we, we just want to keep in mind, you know, with our kids all the time that they are general education kids first, and we want them to be with their general education peers as much as possible. So we always want to help them and boost them and get them to the top of their pyramid so that they can be with their um, general education peers. So here is a snippet for section eight of the IEP, least restrictive environment. So the percentage reflects the amount of time the child is with non-disabled children. And it's based on the physical environment, not the instruction. So that means that in practice, if you have a child who's getting all push-in services in the general education curriculum, their LRE could be 100% because they're with their general education peers, even if they have a modified um, curriculum or they've got lots of accommodations, it's about who they're with physically, not what they're learning. And we have an example. Susie's learning disability in reading and mathematics are to such a degree that she requires time in a more restrictive setting to receive specialized instruction to address her academic deficit. You can talk, tell, you can see that we name the actual disability. She has a learning disability in reading and math, and that they are to such a degree that in order to um, access her education for those deficits, she has to be in a different environment in order to do that. So what you don't see here are service times because we already had those in section seven, and this is literally one sentence. And there's probably a way to like take out, I don't even know, like four words and make it even smaller if you want to. So you can see that we're really not looking for a big complicated um, here. It can be the nature and severity of the child's disability. All right, any questions? Anyone feeling panicky like our question mark here? I hope not. Everyone's feeling okay because we're coming to the end here. We have our office hours um, next week. Carly is actually, well, I'm her backup dancer for this one. She's going to be talking about disability alignment. She's going to talk about the Div 1s. Um, and so that's going to be an interesting one. And then when we get back in January after vacation, when things, you know, start to get, they're really not getting sort of back to normal, but you, you know what I mean by that. We're going to talk about the transition from CDS to public school. We have Jody Basio Smith coming in at the end of January to talk about the alternate assessment. Then we get into transition plans and so on. So we really try to hit um, interesting things that you guys have requested that we do, but also the compliance pieces that, that we as a team look for as well. So it's, it's a little bit of a mixture of things. Here are the links to the resources, the professional development calendar, all of our recordings and PowerPoints. Um, the special education resources, laws and regulations, and all of the required forms and reporting. All right, Carly, you're up. I suppose I didn't actually need to call that out. Like I was <laughs> standing in your living room yelling into your kitchen. It's all good. Okay, so this is, oh, and let me, I'll put it in the chat. Um, this is the link to the feedback, feedback and contact hour form. Um, you can use the link or you can use your mobile device and um, take a picture of that QR code and it will take you to the form. Um, so when you're on the form, you're just going to put, you're going to select the training for today after you fill out the feedback for us. And the training today is just 12, 14, 22, and it's about writing compliant IEPs, section six, seven, and eight. So you'll see that as a selection. And when you are prompted to put in your email, just be careful that you spell it correctly so that um, all of those goodies that Leora talked about at the beginning can get to you. Um, you'll get the procedural manual, user, the quick reference doc, um, the office hours schedule, a copy of this PowerPoint, and your contact hour. So. I'm, re I'm really thinking of these as prizes. Like these are your prizes <laughs> for coming and spending right. some time with us and, you know, looking at you know, extended learning opportunities for you. Like here, here are your prizes for that. And can I say as well that um, we, we actually do keep track of your feedback and we are actively walking through it. 
and embedding the pieces that we're able to embed. So we do take this very seriously. So we appreciate it very much. 100% true, absolutely. All right, so here again is our contact information for you guys. Again, you know, many of you probably have emailed from us from stuff. Hopefully we got back to you soon. Um, but we, we're happy to answer questions as they come up, to give you feedback, just make sure that it's not kids specific. We have the kids' name. Um, and I think that's it. Did I miss anything, you guys? Anything you can think of? No, everything sounded good. All right, I'm going to stop share. Oops, and now I can see everybody, and it makes me a little nervous. Okay. All right, so thank you guys very much for joining us today. Um, and apparently the links page is old. Sorry about that. We'll make sure that next week that it is freshened up for the Dib 1 office hour. All right. So go forth and conquer. Thank you for joining us. We would love to see you next week as well. Bye.